there is an unspoken social contract between citizens, the law, and those that would enforce the law. Amongst some of these terms of the contract is one that says police must follow the laws themselves when enforcing it. A simple axiom that can be compromised once back alley deals get made, mental health issues go untreated, or when power corrupts those that patrol the streets every day. Uniforms make police visible in the communities they are supposed to be protecting, but they can also function as camouflage for predators too scared to be public. Elizabeth Gaskell once said, How easy it is to judge rightly after one sees what evil comes from judging wrongly. However, in the case of our subjects tonight, uniforms obscure the difference between right and wrong, and it no longer becomes easy. We're here to tell true stories about the police and some of the worst the institution has had to bear. Some people are born with an amazing voice. Some people are born with a beautiful face and some people are naturally fast. However, what if the thing that someone was good at made them the most dangerous talent? Born in Sichuan province, he served as a police officer in the People's Liberation Army in Yunnan province between 1989 and 1992. During his tenure, he displayed considerable talent and ability in surveillance, firearm training, and disguises something that he would exploit in later pursuit of his criminal lifestyle. In 2004, Zhang shot and killed a man after robbing him at an ATM. He staked the location and chose the time to strike uncaught. He is thought to be connected to six other fatal robberies, known as Flathead by the Chinese public. He was said to never speak and only gesture and grunt to people on the street to obfuscate his voice. In 2012, he was finally identified on camera during a successful robbery of around $30,000 that resulted in another murder. The Chinese government has spared no expense in money or manpower, offering as much as over $850,000 and has deployed around 13,000 officers to find him. As of the making of this video, Chinese authorities have been unsuccessful in apprehending this dangerous criminal. Sometimes the seeds of evil are planted so deep in the psyche that they do not bear easy fruit to discern. Teaching these lost souls how to kill and disappear essentially transforms them from problematic individual to a high priest of murder in the temple of violence. In Greek myth, the Argus was a giant who was said to be able to see in all directions with its many eyes. Imbued with the functional penchant for being a watcher, the Argus was employed by the gods as a guard. With that many eyes looking outward and nary an eye to look inward, leaves the giant with a natural taste for tyranny. The same question goes with our next case. Who watches the watchers? Chicago Police Commander John Burge started out as a military police officer in 1966 where he received training at Fort Benning, Georgia. After asking twice to serve in Vietnam, he was given his wish as a sergeant providing security services for his base camp, Dong Tam. He would earn five medals including a bronze star and a purple heart while he served there and enjoyed a relatively controversy free career in law enforcement and security. After leaving the military, Burge returned to his native Chicago and pursued an almost stellar career. Burge's stain on his career would come in the form of torture that numbered by conservative estimations at 118 and even estimated as much as over 200 people in forced confessions. He would lead a crew of police officers bound together by their torturous activity known variously as the Midnight Crew, Burge's Sat Kickers, and the A-Team. The group would participate in unspeakable horrors like beating, suffocating, 
hooking electroshock machines up to their genitals, sexually assaulting and sodomizing their victims that were almost all black men. Due to a reign of terror and a culture of silence, Burge and fellow officers never saw justice for this torture, enjoying countless retrials and acquittals. Burge retired and moved to Florida where he sailed on his boat called the Vigilante. Burge wouldn't answer for his crimes. Instead, creative prosecutors were only successful in charging him for perjury and obstruction of justice, netting him only four years in prison. A city reparation fund was created for the victims, and in response, Burge said that he couldn't understand how the city could even contemplate giving reparations to human vermin. When you have a united people in pain, the fabric of trust is forever tattered. How much more for a city and her inhabitants? Police advocates say that there is a thin blue line that separates us from total chaos. But who guards that line and makes sure it keeps the people it claims to protect free from harm? What if that very line created a tragedy and an anti-hero? Adam Phillips said, tragic heroes are failed pragmatists. Their ends are unrealistic and their means are impractical. This next case was a police officer who experienced a fall from grace and he claimed it was due to retaliation for reporting an officer for excessive force. The story ends the same way all tragedies end. Christopher Dorner was a man who felt wrong so passionately, his only revenge he could conceive of was murder. Serving as an LAPD police officer, he was responding to a disturbance with his partner. The incident was from a schizophrenic man who was having a psychotic episode. According to Dorner, the man was kicked in the face and body by his partner who alleged that Dorner was lying about her. After an almost year-long investigation from the LAPD, Dorner was found to be wrong and had to resign from being an officer. Dorner stated that he was punished for breaking the so-called blue line by reporting his fellow officer. After an unsuccessful appeals process, he felt there was nothing else for him to do but wage what he called unconventional and asymmetric warfare on the LAPD. He first murdered Monica Kwan, the lawyer that defended him in the investigation hearings and her fiance. Soon after, he penned a manifesto stating his reasoning behind his homicidal intentions. He wrote that not only did his partner kick a suspect, many LAPD members sang Nazi youth songs to an officer that was a rabbi and son of a Shoah survivor. An excerpt from his manifesto. I didn't need the U.S. Navy to instill honor, courage, and commitment in me, but I thank them for reinforcing it. It's in my DNA. Luckily, I don't have to live every day like most of you, concerned if the misconduct you were a part of is going to be discovered. Looking over your shoulder, scurrying at every phone call from internal affairs or from the captain's office, no, I don't have that concern. I stood up for what was right, but unfortunately have dealt with the repercussions of doing the right thing and now losing my name and everything I ever stood for. He would ambush two officers, gunning them down and ultimately killing them. After a circuitous path to a cabin in Big Bear, California, he would meet his end by an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound during a standoff with the LAPD. Police claim that a pyrotechnic tear gas container shot into the cabin and caught it on fire, activating and discharging all of the ammunition Dorner had gathered while the cabin burned to the ground. Many were critical of LAPD's methods of handling the dismissal and apprehension of Dorner. Three settlements were made, totaling $6 million, due to three people being shot and injured by police who mistakenly identified these victims as Dorner. No criminal charges were ever filed against any member of the LAPD. The price and worth of a name varies from person to person, with some selling out theirs for nothing and some who would defend theirs in blood. The 
upside down tower card in the major arcana of the tarot depicts a sudden crisis on the horizon. A sudden lightning strike that descends the complacent into the abyss of chaos. Our next case will involve those that would exploit the weak in the wreckage of devastation. In the sweltering and oppressive heat of August 2005, New Orleans was about to be devastated from Hurricane Katrina, breaching through levees built to protect its fair city. Drowning 80% of the city, Katrina turned people out into the streets, destroyed livelihoods, and ultimately killed over 1,900 people. However, there were also cops misbehaving during the tragedy, from looting stores for Rolex watches to wanton murder. On September 4th, in the aftermath of the destruction from the flooding, several police officers in plain clothes, including Sergeant Kenneth Bowen, Sergeant Robert Jasivius, Officer Anthony Villavaso, and Officer Robert Falcon, pulled up on the Danzinger Bridge. The men opened fire without warning on a family, the Bartholomews, who had been walking to a grocery store and were then sheltering behind a concrete barrier. In the first part of the incident, 17-year-old James Brissett, a family friend, was killed, and four other civilians were wounded. Susan Bartholomew's arm was partially shot off and later had to be amputated. Her husband, Leonard, was shot in the back, head and foot. The Bartholomew's teenage daughter, Leisha, was shot four times. Jose Holmes Jr., a friend of Brissette's, was shot in the abdomen, the hand and the jaw. Two brothers, Ronald and Lance Madison, fled the scene but were pursued down the bridge by Jasivius and Falcon and an unmarked state police vehicle. Falcon fired his shotgun from the back of the car at Ronald, a developmentally disabled man who would later die from his injuries. The autopsy found that Ronald Madison sustained seven gunshot wounds, five of them in his back. Bowen was later convicted of stomping Madison on the back before he died, though this conviction was overturned for lack of physical evidence. Lance Madison was then taken into custody and charged with eight counts of attempting to kill police officers. He was held in custody for three weeks before being released without indictment. There were concerted efforts to hide the truth of the events and even plant evidence for disinformation. Ultimately, four of the officers received hefty sentences of 60 to 40 years in prison and were reduced greatly to 10 to 3 years due to a strange incident of prosecutorial misconduct. Only one person would be prosecuted for covering up evidence and colluding with the officers, and he received one year probation. When evil is allowed to fester in the blue-black shadows of fraternity, it will only come into the light when it is ready to kill. Aristotle once said, Man is armed with craft and courage, which untamed by justice, he will most wickedly pervert and become at once the most impious and the fiercest of monsters. Wickedly pervert is an apt term to use in describing our last case. When the demons of the past catch up to our present, justice and mercy become relics of another time, thrusting the evil deeds into the future. Former Russian police officer and security guard Mikhail Popkov was known as a perfect father and model husband when he was apprehended for the brutal murders and rape of up to 78 women. He confessed to 81. The murders began around 1992 when Popkov would use his uniform and more frequently his car in the cold Siberian nights, picking up prostitutes, as he said, cleansing the streets and sexually and physically brutalizing them with a gruesome range of melee weapons from axes to screwdrivers. These killings earned him the nickname, The Werewolf, and he evaded justice for a long time due to the suspected profile of the killer being much further than a police officer. While many theories exist as to why he chose and killed his victims, Popkoff claimed he did it because of a suspected affair his wife had this was largely informed by him allegedly finding two used condoms in the trash. Popkov said, I just had some reasons to suspect her. 
I'm not looking for excuses, but this was the impetus for my future, in reference to his wife's suspected infidelity and the murders. He would be caught due to finding tracks from a 4x4 vehicle used by the police. A DNA test was administered to 3,500 police against samples found at the crime scenes. When asked about technological advances and criminal justice that ultimately led to catching him, Popkoff coldly and matter-of-factly stated, I was born in another century. Now there are such modern technologies, methods, but not earlier. If we have not got that level of genetic examination, then I would not be sitting in front of you. He is currently serving two life sentences in Russia. Simone Vier once said, whether the mask is labeled fascism, democracy, or dictatorship of the proletariat, our great adversary remains the apparatus, the bureaucracy, the police, the military, not the one facing us across the frontier of the battle lines, which is not so much our enemy as our brother's enemy, but the one that calls itself our protector and makes us its slaves. No matter what the circumstances, the worst betrayal will always be to subordinate ourselves to this apparatus and to trample underfoot in its service all human values in ourselves and in others. For many reasons, as we've seen, people become police for good reasons and not so good reasons. And sometimes even the ones that join for good reasons still end up a killer. I want to thank you all that took the time and chance to listen to us. Our only aim is to get better with every video, so we want to step up the quality every time. Please like and subscribe and hit the bell so you can get the notifications of every time Pitch Black Lore makes another story, mini doc, or anything else that we want to do. And if you have any suggestions or anything you want to see us do, please let us know in the comments below. We hope to hear you soon. Thank you.